Hello and welcome back to Shakespeare. We are going to finish up with the birth of Merlin today. We're going to get to hear a monologue from Merlin in Act 5, Scene 1, and then we're going to talk about Act 5, Scene 2 and do a recap because the play's just about over, which this one went by really quick, and it's because there's not a lot of really big monologues in it, uh, which I think might be why it might be classified more towards the comedy side of things. A lot of comedies don't tend to have as many monologues in them as the tragedies or the histories do. But the things that are going on, um, the Saxons and the Britons were both going to try to get Vortiger, whose castle wouldn't stand up, but he knows that he's basically going to lose. He was killed um, in a in a battle with Edal, but he died off stage. And when they saw this dragon in the sky that portends all these things, Merlin was like, "Oh, I didn't realize he was dying so soon." And it's because Aurelius also died. He was poisoned by Artesia and the Saxons back at home. Uh, so Ulther is now king, but everybody's very sad that Aurelius has died. But the Britons are feeling good about their chances of winning this war against the Saxons, or at least winning these battles against the Saxons. So yeah, at the end of yesterday's bits, uh, we had them basically saying, you know, hail King Ulther and um, let's go off and, and finish up this war, basically. So Act 5, Scene 1, we shift focus a little bit, and we have Joan entering, followed by the devil. He is pursuing her because he wants to impregnate her again, but she's not having it this time. She's like, you know, you're not as attractive to me as you were before, and I see right through this. I know what you're trying to do. Like, no, I, I want none of this. And he's, he's getting a little rapey at this point. He's going to force himself on her, and he conjures some spirits to try to, like, hold her down so that he can do what he wants to. But then Merlin appears, and being the stronger magician, I guess he's a stronger magician than even the devil is. He, is, you know, says some words. He says some threatening things to the devil. He's like, ah, you're just the devil. Eh? Like, there's nothing to you, whatever. Um, and he pulls out his wand and, and um, gets rid of the spirits that the devil had conjured and then it says some more things to the devil. They have a, a little back and forth about, oh, now you know your father and uh, all this sort of stuff. But um, Merlin ends up encasing the devil in rock to keep him from preventing or to keep him from doing any further harm to anyone. He, you know, ha says some stuff in Latin. He pulls out his wand and says some stuff in Latin and the devil gets encased in rock so that he's immobile and not able to do anything. And Joan is like, you know, thanks, thanks for that, but sort of, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, I, what what is the rest of my life gonna be, sort of? And Merlin says, take comfort now. Past times are ne'er recalled. I did foresee your mischief and prevent it. Hark, how the sounds of war now calls me hence to aid Pendragon that in battle stands against the Saxons, from whose aid Merlin must not be absent. Leave this soil, and I'll conduct you to a place retired, which I, by art, have raised, called Merlin's Bower. There shall you dwell with solitary sighs, with groans and passions, your companions, to weep away this flesh you have offended with, and leave all bare unto your aerial soul. And when you die, I will erect a monument upon the verdant plains of Salisbury. No king shall have so high a sepulchre with pendulous stones that I will hang by art, where neither lime nor mortar shall be used, a dark enigma to the memory, for none shall have the power to number them, a place that I will hollow for your rest, where no night hag shall walk, nor werewolf tread, where Merlin's mother shall be sepulchred. So, as with many of the other monologues in this play, this is Merlin prophesying stuff. He's like, you know, don't worry about the devil coming back to get you. I knew that was coming. I fixed it. You're safe now. Oh, whoops, there's this war happening, and I have to go help the new king, Ulther Pendragon, fight off the Saxons. But before I go, we're going to take you somewhere safe. I've I've built this place that's called Merlin's Bower, and you're going to live out the rest of your life there sort of in a solitary manner. It's not necessarily that he's like 
banishing her or encaging her somewhere. It's just she's going to go live out the rest of her life in this place by herself. But when she dies, he's going to build a monument to her out of stones where no lime or mortar is used. And maybe it's a ring of stones in which she's... There's allusions to this as Stonehenge. To this is maybe the origins of Stonehenge is what he's getting at here. That this is where she will be interred uh, for, for the rest of eternity when she dies. But it'll be somewhere where she's safe. Where no, no creatures of the night will be able to disturb her body in this sepulcher that he's going to build for her. Which historians... Think, uh, historians looking at this play think that it's an allusion to this is how Stonehenge was built, was Merlin built it to bury his mom there. And that's the end of Act 5, Scene 1. So then Act 5, Scene 2, which is the last scene of the play, we finally get back to Donabert and the lovers. Remember we had a couple of sets of lovers that were going to get married and then they decided not to because the women wanted to be pious? Well, yeah, we don't get to see the women anymore. We just get to see the men now. So it's Donabur and Gloucester, and Donabur is like, oh, I just saw my daughters go and like submit themselves to a monastery, and I'm never going to see them again. And what a disappointment that like they're not going to have children. Like I raised daughters to carry on my legacy, but instead they go and they join a nunnery. Like what a disappointment is that? And and Gloucester's fairly understanding about it, but then uh, the two potential husbands come in, Edwin and Cawdor, and Donabur's like, oh, I wanted you to be my sons. And they're like, it's okay, we get it. They're, they're going to do their thing. We'll still stay in touch. And Donabur's like, you know what? When I die, I'm going to leave my property to the two of you. And they're like, oh, that's that's very kind of you. Uh, but then word comes in that Ulther has been victorious. And it, like, there's this whole train of Ulther and Edel and everybody. And Artesia and several other Saxons are bound. They've been captured. And they're like, okay, this is the woman. This is the woman that killed Aurelius. What are we going to do to her? And I think it's Ulther is like, well, we're going to leave her body out to be dried by the sun and then we'll flay her skin and stuff her with straw and put that on parade and people are going to have to pay two pence a pop to see the stuffed skin of this traitor to to the British, um, to the Britain crown. And she's like, oh, that's so boring and tr so trite. Why can't you come up with a better torture? Like, is your torture planner guy on vacation right now? And they're like, no, maybe we'll just burn her at the stake. And she's like, well, that's what happens to a phoenix. And the, the, uh, finally they decide that they are going to encase her in a wall so that she can just starve to death. And she's like, yeah, I'll starve to death, but what's going to keep me going for a while is the joy that I get from the fact that I that I undid the Briton king that I killed Aurelius. So they leave so that she can be encased in a wall, at which point Ulther turns to Merlin and he's like, okay, so what's the rest of my future? Which I think is kind of interesting because in yesterday's monologue, Ulther laid out like his entire family lineage for the rest of basically ever. But um, I guess they wanted another opportunity to give Merlin some fun thing to do. So Merlin is like, well, I can tell you, but it'd be better if I just show you. So he conjures some spirits that are supposed to be King Arthur and then 13 kings or princes that come and lay down their crowns for King Arthur. And then death comes for Arthur. And as he's getting sick, he crowns Constantine. And that's this cute little sort of dumb show that happens and Merlin is like, this is it. This is it. your son Arthur is going to be this this great, amazing king, and he's going to unite the kingdoms, and all the other kings are going to swear allegiance to him until such time as he can't anymore, and then he's just barely going to be able to name a successor before he dies, and that's that. And Arthur's like, you know what? I think Merlin's proven himself by this point as being a really good soothsayer, so let's. Let's all just believe that this is what's going to happen in the future, and thanks, Merlin. And that's the end of the play. So in general, in general, I enjoyed this play. And I can see how there would be some Shakespearean elements in it, from basic structure to the, like, the really quick rapid fire battle scenes in Act 4 that happen, uh, some of the wordplay, things like that, some of the, the imagery. And I don't know that it was necessarily 
Shakespeare specific or if it was more just Jacobean, but uh, the having the lovers, having the war, having the the clown with his sister Joan looking for the father, having these three different plot lines was a, a pretty prevalent type of structure in Shakespearean and Jacobean plays. So I could see where that influence is there. But one thing that I find interesting about this play is that so much of it is in prose as opposed to being in verse. And granted, a lot of the comedies have a lot more prose in them than they necessarily have in verse. And oftentimes the verse that exists in the comedies exists in the form of rhyming couplets. A lot of the monologues and even a lot of like the shorter passages, but the ones that are like seven lines or eight lines, stuff like that, the first bit will be in prose and then maybe the last two lines of it will be a rhyming couplet in verse, which is I think an, a, an interesting tactic to use. It almost gives it this feel of the characters are just sort of blathering and talking about something, but then they finish it with something intelligent. Because <laughs> there is that whole, you know, the characters that speak in prose are maybe of a, a lower social status or a lower educational level than those who speak in verse typically. So, but I do think that it's interesting that prose and verse are so intertwined in this play because it, it sort of gives everybody an opportunity to maybe be a little dumb and trying to figure things out, but then they, they get to the right intelligent answer by the end of it. So that's cool. And, I, you know, I love the characters of Joan and the clown. And Merlin's cool, and there's the opportunity for some really fun spectacle in this. I think that, like, the actual, actual ending is maybe a little bit disappointing, and, and it might be more fun to have something other than, like, okay, let's just believe Merlin from here on out. And then the play is over. It could have been maybe a little bit more exciting than that or maybe if you're in a production of this you want to slap a dance number at the end of it just to call it a day or throw another dragon in the sky or something like that just to give it a little oomph at the ending so beyond that i'm curious to hear what you all thought of the birth of merlin did this feel shakespearean to you did it not did you like the plot did you understand the characters did you like all my little notes that i had to put in the videos when i messed up somebody's name pronunci pronunciation and things like that but anyway i would love to hear what you think please leave your thoughts in the comments and please come back tomorrow as we start in on edmund ironside which will take us quite a bit longer to get through than The Birth of Merlin did. So come on back tomorrow for a new play day and we'll start in on that one. I'll see you then. Mwah.